you know, good luck. <laughs> Any other questions? That's great. I'm just going to add to that real quick. I'd say the one thing that we see for for how or for why companies uh, don't have the the success that uh, we all expect is is hiring. So is, is your team, and part of that is think about when you start building your business, you want to build a very strong foundation. That's everything from a legal team to uh, you know to your initial investors to your co-founder. Build a very strong foundation, but then after that, you start building your team. Every single hire you make is going to have a massive importance on, on the company. Um, so be very mindful about the culture and, and the team that you're hiring. Any more questions? So I heard you guys speak about uh, big market sizes and um, all the different ways that you should have a good pitch. So I feel like, um, what if you feel like you got a good market size and you have a great pitch deck? How do you actually get investors to actually sit down and listen to your pitch if you're still in like the Series A phases of it? So, I mean, there, there's a couple ways of, of getting introduced, or you can even just call it outreach. If, if you find, I think the most important thing at the early stage when you're when you're looking for investors to uh, to give your pitch, find them that find investors that will fit either your business, so whether it's the stage, whether they've invested in a similar industry you have or you're working in. Um, so find one that would be a good fit. Uh, typically, it's best to get a warm introduction. So of course, that can be hard if you don't have introductions in, into, uh, into VCs. But one kind of hack into that is um, reach out to someone in their portfolio, some sort of founder in their portfolio that's working in uh, maybe a similar industry or someone who you think you can reach out to and ask for advice or feedback. And then after that, being able to ask that that CEO to introduce introduce you to uh, the VCs is a, is a it's a pretty good way to get to do that. Um, but also just networking, figuring out ways to, to get introduced to the right people. Uh, but just make sure they are a good fit for, for what you're working on. That's a great question, and um, I 100% agree with you. The only thing I'd add to that, in my experience, is to put it out there. You know, I've made 45 investments in, in startup companies. I have not yet once. Uh, funded a company uh, based on a cold call. Now, I'm not a snob, I'm not one of those people that automatically just like won't look at it. I actually read all the emails I get, but I get like almost 400 a day, and a lot of those are pitches, right? So the truth is, I skim it quickly. So the reality is that um, the advice that he gave me in terms of hacking, it sounds like great practical advice, so, so do that. But no matter what happens, I know everyone's here is high energy and very determined, don't do the cold call route. Even if you have to like look at your LinkedIn and see what second degree connection you have, build a list of targets, see who you know firsthand. If you can't figure out an organic way to meet someone at the conference, um, figure out somebody in your network that knows someone. And if you can't, that's, that's even better advice actually. Entrepreneurs are always down to talk. Get one of them to introduce you. But um, you add more friction, but that's the only way to do it. Yeah, just to add to that, just network. Um, one thing that I do, actually, a third of my um, of my workday is to find out people who are further along than myself, um, do the more experience, gap, or whatever, and I find a way to, to um, be of value, be of help, and have coffee with them. And I've gotten the most ROI from that by far by anything I do. So little by little, they come, they come along. Like if, if people call, call, I don't even take phone calls if you don't have no problem. I just, I just don't. So um, and that's not again not to be snob. It's just like it's. It's just the way the world works these days. Um, so yeah, that's really a network. Thank you guys. Uh, also to add to that is when you're launching your product, don't wait till the last minute and then say, oh, now I have to raise money. If you do that ahead of time, start researching before your product's ready, get ready to set it up and talk to the right people. Got a question? Uh, so the question is, as founders, we quite often raise do fundraising, not just for money, right, but for some added value, for expertise, network, so-called smart money concept. So what you guys, what kind of value do you bring to companies you invest in? Well, for me personally, I make sure it's only um, industries where I have some sort of experience where it can be a value add situation, to your point. So that's, that's really it, where you know, when you, um, for instance, one of my, um, one of my properties, um, 
property companies is, is in the media industry. I've been part of a media ex media exit before, so I know exactly how the industry works. I know exactly how to monetize. I know how to build it with um, minimal funding needed. So I can sort of guide that in the right direction, and that's where you can unlock. Uh, for instance, we recently launched a media company, and inside, and this is not an exaggeration, inside uh, two weeks we had a reach of 10 million readers, and it got a valuation of 400,000 based on um, another investment. So uh, that, that's, that's an example, but that's just based off bootstrapping and understanding the industry. So does that answer your question? I, I basically only focus on early stage businesses like pre-seed, seed, maybe once or twice I've done Series A. Um, what all early stage businesses have in common for the most part is that they're all very stressful and I'm pretty good like in those environments. So I'll add value then. And then the way it usually works out is the company starts to scale, they tend to rely less on investors, especially angels, and uh, that works out fine. Um, it's a good trade-off, smart money versus just money, but I think you'll find that sometimes you need to compromise and if you need to fill out around relatively quickly, it's not popular. People tell you now, don't do that. But the truth is, like, sometimes the best thing a VC could do is just be supportive of you, um, but not necessarily like metal in like your 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 day to day. That's also a nightmare, and I've been through that. So, so our model is when we we invest into seed and pre seed rounds, we typically take a board seat, and what that means is we end up being the kind of the first call for these founders who, and we're gonna be the, the investors who are probably gonna be with them for you know, over five years plus. Um, so one of the things that we, and we think about your point a lot, you know, how can we best support founders? Part of that is choosing industries and uh, that we have some experience in. So whether that's companies that we've invested in in the, in the past and we can introduce them to uh, you know, the CEOs of companies that are now, you know, have 3,000 employees and they can talk about some of their growing pains there. Um, a lot of institutional funds, VCs, they can all introduce you to probably the same people. They all have some sort of degrees of connections there. So if somebody you know, says they can introduce you to the CEO of Dunkin' Donuts, pretty much they all can. So um, take that for what it's worth. But having the other thing that we like to say we can bring to the table, we have you know two decades plus of uh, venture experience. Um, so being able to have seen kind of the ups and downs of not just public markets, but also just experience of founders, and especially at that early stage, going from two individuals to a, a company that's you know going public um, on markets. Okay, one more question. Uh, hi, thank you for coming and having this panel. Um, so my question is about uh, what you look in early companies before you invest, and particularly in hardware companies, because most of the companies that are around are software companies, but say you have a hardware company or a software company with a very heavy hardware component, what specifically do you look for and do you invest in those companies? So we've, we've historically invested in that space a bunch. Um, we are, for the most part, not investing in hardware anymore. Um, the reason being is we've just, it's, it's challenging to scale a hardware business. Uh, you know, the most recent one, you can, you can look up some of the, um, the challenge they, they uh, face is called Jibo. They were a, a robot, and one of the things they face, of course, is uh, Alexa and Google came with uh, uh, Amazon and Google came with Alexa and, and the Google Home, and that you know. So a lot of it, the challenge is is not just with the looking for uh, you know the economics within hardware, but it's also there's these different market dynamics, some things that you just can't plan for, and then hardware just given the the challenge of the being able to iterate on hardware and it's not, it doesn't have the flexibility or agility that uh, investing in a software company does. For me personally, I mean like, you know, all respect in the world to you, but it almost feels like running two companies at once. You know, there's like the hardware and the software issues all together. So I'm trying to think, I don't think I've invested in a hardware company ever. I would never say never, but that's beyond at least, you know, my duty specifically. I'm not gonna pretend that I understand the hardware space, hardware space, but compared to software, there's two glaring issues that come up right away. One is gross margins and overhead. So that alone will make me go in. So that's that's the challenge. I'm not saying I, I could be wrong. There's plenty of lucrative in, uh, businesses in that industry, but that's just from my perspective, um, what I will look at. All right, I think we're gonna wrap up.
So let's give a round of applause for RBC. If you guys want to, um, any closing remarks, anywhere people can reach you, if you want to give out any of that information, websites, email, whatever. Um, I'm on Twitter, Philip underscore Michael, my name. Um, I'm on Instagram, YFWTB, and that's where you can find me. Hit me up there. My email is phil at nyag.co. Hit me up anytime, and um, yeah, I'll get, I, I answer. Yeah, yeah, pretty much every email. Three ways for me. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so my name's kind of unique. You can feel free to add me there. Um, email is also kind of unique too. You can just reach me at. Let's not use the Jello shots one. Let's use um, <laughs> David at Carbon dot Money. That's one. And then my, you can you can you know add me on Instagram if you want to at bseg10. But it's mostly just party photos and food things like that. So it's not going to help business on. You should definitely follow him on Instagram. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's uh, first name, last name, Adrian Burkow. Um, you can add me on LinkedIn as well. Awesome. One more round of applause for these guys. <laughs> so we're going to be wrapping up here in the next uh, probably 15 to 20 minutes. Um, you guys can feel free to network for the next, uh, you know, few minutes and whatnot, we are doing an after party at Skyroom, which is on 40th between 8th and 9th. Everyone here gets uh, free entry, and I think we're also doing drink specials. Maybe. Drinks are on Jimmy, so just hit him up. <laughs> um, but besides that, thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you to Heartland, and if anyone has any questions, anyone wants to get involved, let me know. But thanks, guys.